According to this channel's analytics, most of you are old enough to remember living through the 16-bit era of gaming. In this console war of epic proportion between Nintendo and Sega, a key moment that will stick out to many was, of course, the release of Donkey Kong Country. To many, Donkey Kong Country offered the most impressive graphics that 16-bit game consoles had seen as of yet. This title was the first home console game in history to feature pre-rendered 3D graphics, which had been produced using expensive silicon graphics computers. The results spoke for themselves, and Donkey Kong Country would become one of the best-selling Super Nintendo games of all time, even spawning two beloved sequels on the hardware. The British-made Donkey Kong Country series was one of the crown jewels of an entire console generation. But if it was such a shock that the Super Nintendo was capable of hosting such a graphically impressive series of games, then it is even more ridiculous that a Donkey Kong Country game of this style also exists on the far more rudimentary 8-bit NES. So today, let's look at the history of this video game, how it was possible and why it exists. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the illegal Donkey Kong Country 4 for the NES. Donkey Kong Country for the Super Nintendo was a ridiculously impressive game. While it is easy to consider the game another result of Nintendo magic, in reality, outside of financing and licensing, the Big N had little to do with the development of this classic game. Donkey Kong character creator Shigeru Miyamoto had minimal involvement with DKC's development and only game designer Greg Mayles and Rare director Tim Stamper had any significant ties to Nintendo during the project. A British team of 20 developers set out to make a game like Super Mario but with a modern take. This effort would include the most man-hours ever invested into producing one title, adding up to 22 years in total. This amount of work on one single game was unheard of at the time, but through the drive and passion of a young team, one of the most technically impressive games ever made was produced. From the easy pick-up-and-play seamlessly flowing gameplay by Greg Mayles to Kevin Bayliss's Diddy Kong and new Donkey Kong character designs, the entire Donkey Kong franchise had been moved forward, modernised and redefined for an entire generation. So, if this was the case, how did a Donkey Kong Country game end up on the NES? As highlighted here across many videos in the past, as exciting as the 16-bit generation was, by the mid-90s it certainly cannot be said that the entire world was ready for it yet. In developing countries and those evolving fresh off the back of the collapse of the Soviet Union, money was tighter, trade was tougher and in many cases piracy laws were much laxer. This allowed Taiwanese bootleg Famiclone consoles to flourish in multiple regions around the world, including the likes of the Pegasus consoles in Poland, which we have already covered in a standalone video, so be sure to check that one out later if you want to learn about one of these Famiclone countries' video game ecosystems. Since not many people in these regions owned Super Nintendos, this would mean that Taiwanese bootleggers, such as Hummer Team, would develop 8-bit versions of the likes of Street Fighter 2 and Super Mario World, but to run on bootleg Nintendo clone consoles instead. But before they got around to making their own version of the popular Donkey Kong Country, some important steps towards the game were being taken in an official capacity first. 
This brings us to the Donkey Kong Land Trilogy, a trio of 8-bit games that would be introduced to the world with the first Donkey Kong Land game in 1995. Produced just one year after the first super impressive Donkey Kong Country game on the Super Nintendo, gamers would be sceptical that a game of this style would even be possible on the rudimentary Game Boy. An idea that would be further compounded by how horrible many Game Boy conversions of 16-bit classics often were back in the day. But to Nintendo console owners' surprise, Donkey Kong Land was a surprisingly faithful effort that even featured the same style pre-rendered silicon computer-produced graphics. A Donkey Kong Country-like game really could be played on 8-bit hardware. As amazing as Donkey Kong Country was on the Super Nintendo, even on release, some in the gaming community would often try to discredit the success of the game by claiming it only sold as well as it did due to having good graphics. Seeing this coming, this attitude was satirised in the game from day one, through the use of the Cranky Kong character, a Kong who was apparently an aged version of the same Donkey Kong who appeared in the original 1981 arcade game. Cranky Kong would hilariously, constantly chastise the player for enjoying the 1994 title, with quotes like, you know what they say, all graphics and no gameplay. Games never looked like this when I was a lad. The trouble with you kids is that you're all too soft. The old games were far harder when I was a young'un. We used to play for hours on a single screen game and think we were lucky. And we were. You wouldn't last two minutes in a real game. I could get through DK Country with only one life, easy. I'm talking about when games were games. Back in my days, we used to have real gameplay. So next time you mock those youngsters for playing games like Fortnite and Among Us on their new fandangled hardware, then please be self-aware enough to realise that you yourself have become Cranky Kong. So, why am I talking about this in a video that is supposed to be about 8-bit Donkey Kong Country? Well, in Donkey Kong Land, Cranky Kong would return via the game's instruction manual, where he would be able to continue to give his old-fashioned views. Here he mocks Diddy and Donkey Kong, stating that Donkey Kong only sold well due to elaborate graphics and the power of the modern Super Nintendo. Cranky taunts them, saying that they cannot possibly succeed on a monochrome handheld, causing Diddy Kong and the new Donkey Kong to accept his challenge and prove they can make a success of themselves in the 8-bit world, just as they did in the 16-bit one. The trilogy of games would prove successful, delivering a more than adequate Donkey Kong Country-like experience on the 8-bit Game Boy. But more importantly for today's story, the game would also offer up key building blocks to allow for the programming of a bootleg Famicom game that would include 8-bit renders of Rare's silicon graphics. The illegal 1997 bootleg video game known as Donkey Kong Country 4 would be developed by Hummer Team and published by the JY Company, the very same pairing that brought us the 1995 8-bit version of Super Mario World that we looked at last week on this channel. Despite being given the dubious title of Donkey Kong Country 4, rather than trying to offer up completely new experiences as the title suggests, this Famiclone game instead offers up what is essentially a shorter, scaled-down version of the first game that appeared on the Super Nintendo. But elements from the Donkey Kong Land games are pulled over to this title too. 
For example, due to the Famicom's limitations, you never got both Kongs on the screen at once, but instead can swap between them by pressing select. Still, it is clear that this version of the game has been produced to run on a home console, as opposed to a handheld like the other 8-bit versions of the game. The teleporting animation when breaking a DK barrel and shrinking while swapping out Kongs also seems to have been taken or at least influenced by Donkey Kong Land. What I mean by this is that if you play Donkey Kong Land, the sprites are large and take up big chunks of the screen so that they are easier to see on the Game Boy's tiny, poorly lit monochrome screens. Whereas in Donkey Kong Country 4, the sprites are much smaller, like in Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo. So, good work, 8-bit bootleggers. While the original Donkey Kong Country offered a different overworld map screen for each section of the game, this scaled down bootleg version only offers one map screen to access stages, which is the world map screen from the first game that shows the entire island. As for the stages themselves, as already mentioned, the game is scaled back. For example, we get to play through a jungle-themed stage, an underwater aquatic ambience level, and a mine stage, before getting to face off against the game's first boss, who is once again an opponent that Donkey Kong Country players will already be familiar with. This acts as the groundwork for the structure of the game, consisting of blocks of three stages, followed up with a boss fight. The game consists of a fair amount of content, which culminates with a boss fight against King K. Rool. However, it is certainly of note that the title doesn't offer the same amount of stage diversity as the original, but then again, what else can you really expect from an 8-bit Taiwanese book? bootleg of one of the most technically impressive games on the Super Nintendo. Other absent features include Donkey Kong Country's Yoshi-style animal buddies, and like the majority of Famicom games, the title does suffer from some sprite flicker. Further to all this, to save on costs, these Famiclone cartridges did not come with save batteries, meaning that players could not save their progress like those who played the original. To make up for this though, the pirates were thoughtful enough to implement a password system, but accessing this at points can be far from convenient. To put it simply, passwords can be accessed whenever a player gets a game over, but for those who have played Donkey Kong Country, it is not uncommon to rack up 20 plus lives. Donkey Kong Country 4 is no different in this regard, so if players want that password, a lot of acts of in-game suicide are often necessary to be able to pick up and play where they last left off. Not exactly convenient if you're in a rush, but then again, who's going to be in a rush when you own this kind of awesomeness? The fantastic bootleggames.fandom was also able to provide me with lots of key information regarding similarities between this game and others developed by the Hummer team. For example, similar graphical errors are being reported across this game, 8-bit Mario World and the infamous Samari. Further to this, every Famicom title bootleg features the same sound container format known as the NSF or Nintendo Sound Format. These hold games audio code. Donkey Kong Country 4's NSF includes the likes of the Ghost House theme from Hummer Team's Mario World, along with the game's castle theme and ending theme. This may suggest that Donkey Kong Country 4, or at least its sound, was built off of that game. Earlier versions of the music tracks can also be found in the NSF for Earthworm Jim 3, but that game is an interesting story for a whole different video.
In terms of obscure trivia regarding this game, perhaps the most amusing fact relates to how the bootleggers would double dip on profits with this one. The very same year this game saw release, it was also released under a different name of Jungle Book 2. As I mean, why on earth not, considering most of the game takes place in a jungle? Jungle Book 2 is hilariously the same game, only that Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong have been switched out for Mowgli, resulting in very amusing results indeed. The publishers would even be cheeky enough to sell this game on another cartridge marketed as 2-1, a cartridge that lets you play both Donkey Kong Country 4 and Jungle Book 2. Awesome! To give you an idea of how long this game was on the market, it was in circulation until at least 2001, with copies of the game being sold in Russia that featured cartridge labels which are basically screenshots of Donkey Kong taken straight from Super Smash Bros Melee. Piracy sometimes has no shame. Just one year after the release of this bootleg in 1997, there would be finally an official release of an 8-bit version of Donkey Kong Country, which would see release on the Game Boy Color in 1998. This title would receive rave reviews from critics, instantly becoming the ultimate 8-bit Donkey Kong Country experience, proving to doubters once and for all that there was more to love about Donkey Kong Country beyond the game's stunning graphics on the Super Nintendo. But before this game was even a thing, we did have Donkey Kong Country 4. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the illegal 8-bit demake of Donkey Kong Country 4. And if you enjoyed this video, I did a video recently on the 8-bit demake of Super Mario World. Now, usually at the ends of my videos, I like to answer a question from my patrons. But today, I am here saying to you that if you enjoy what I do, then please consider backing this channel on Patreon. Not only will I answer whichever question you would like answered at the end of the video, but you get early access to my videos and I have other perks available too. So yes, head over to Patreon and if not, just go back through my entire backlog of content and watch every single video and then write me a lovely comment to tell me exactly why it was the best video you've ever seen in your life. Thank you very much. See you next time.